Hey y'all, I'm Kelly Moody and you're listening to the Ground Shots Podcast, an audio project exploring our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling with farmers, herbalists, craftspeople, naturalists, artists, and more. Hey y'all, it's Kelly, and you're listening to episode 7 of the Ground Shots podcast. I'm currently back in Nevada City, California, after spending a month in Virginia, where I'm from. And half that time I was at the Cornmeal Press residency I mentioned in the last episode, and the other half of the time I spent in my hometown of South Hill, Virginia, on the border of North Carolina and Virginia, a little dot on the map there, and I hung out with my dad, harvesting ginger, got to see my papa, and sort through some of my things, and work in my dad's garden, and it was just super sweet to be at home and to see my friends and family there. I haven't been been there in October in quite a while, so it was super sweet, and now I'm back reunited with my little mini camper home that I live in. Um, I'm 31, and a lot of my 20s have kind of lived in different mobile, semi-mobile, or kind of seasonally mobile living scenarios, and I kind of like this camper right now. It's pretty cool. It's from the 70s, and it is sort of a, it doesn't go over the cab of the truck, but it has a lot of the things that a slide and truck camper would have. A little kitchenette that's super cute and a table bed sort of conversion setup and storage, little icebox fridge. And I pretty much do a lot of my stuff for the blog and the ground shots project and this podcast kind of oriented out of this camper or at friends' homes who graciously host me, so Thank you to those folks who have done that. And I just wanted to kind of share that little tidbit about my life because there's a whole lot there I could share about the pros and cons of that. So um, if you're interested, let me know. Maybe I will share more in the future. Episode 7 of the Ground Shots podcast features a conversation with Rebecca Beyer of Blood and Spice Bush based out of Asheville, North Carolina. We did this interview actually back in May, so it's November now, and it's a little bit delayed in getting it out there to y'all, but um, it's how it goes sometimes. And as you'll hear, Becky teaches about Southern Appalachian folk medicine traditions and craft, mainly doing in-person classes in Western North Carolina. And I used to live in Asheville, and we met when I did, and we've been friends ever since. We talk about uh, syncretic elements of Appalachian folk medicine. Um, We talk about navigating how stories are told about Appalachian folk medicine and the erasure that often happens of the contribution of West African folks in particular. We discuss issues around wild crafting, especially since Becky makes her living foraging and teaching about foraging. We touch on the nuances of navigating sensitive topics like cultural appropriation and the stories of rural people when teaching. And we talk about a few plants of that region and a little bit more. There's a few things I wanted to kind of note before getting into this conversation with Becky. Uh, Just after listening to the interview quite a few times, doing edits and stuff, I just, some things came to mind. I realize sometimes I create this false duality when talking about the West Coast and the East Coast of the United States or Turtle Island, and I have been reconsidering my use of this um, created duality and how language of direction is used 
when talking about places and groups of people in the land. And I think that making this generalized duality might be problematic at times, and I think it can sometimes not acknowledge the nuances of each place by doing that, but also I think that not everyone really feels the same way about um, these directions of East and West and every place in its history and culture is so dynamic and different, and I don't want to erase that reality. Um, in my writing and on the podcast and um, in my conversations with people in my life, I talk about broad generalizations a lot, and I know I'm also guilty of making the, these two, and, and I know in some instances it just, you can't help but do it, and it's sort of useful to bring together things that um come that come together yeah in a common idea but often the broad generalizations like I said kind of erase uniqueness and erase individual scenarios and the personhood of of people in place so I think in the case of this conversation with Becky especially when we talk about colonialism I wanted to basically just make a point about the fact that things look different on the East Coast because of European colonialism happening there earlier than in the West. So it's kind of the purpose of that use of dual language. I think that traveling has really like kind of given me a lot more perspective than I ever thought I would have being from a small town in Virginia. And growing up in Virginia, a lot of, you know, Virginia is very Virginia-centric and there's a lot taught about this sort of glorified historical celebration of Virginia. <laughs> if I don't really know how to say it right, but it's like we really don't get as much perspective on what happened in other parts of the United States and the world, really, when you learn about history in the same way that you get at least the story of Virginia. Of course, it told from certain perspectives. Anyway, I just... Um, I have a lot to learn, so just stating that. I want to note, too, that I say in the podcast that Native folks where I, I am from don't have land or very much state or federal recognition, and this is true to an extent, but I know I need to look further into this. Um, it is true that there is very little land set aside for the tribes in the southeast and in the specific region where I'm from, like the Okanichi and the Meharan tribes. Um, which are in that region. But uh, some of them, like the Meharan, actually do have state recognition and other tribes in the region fight a lot to get state recognition. And Becky mentions in the podcast the Catawba tribe, which she works with sometimes and their struggle with that. So I realize more and more these days um, how much European colonialism of the region affects the visibility and recognition of Native presence and the um, interpretation of Native presence. I want to mention that we have a Patreon, and without it, this podcast, as well as other work I do with the Ground Shots Project, could not be possible. If you feel like you can support this work from the $1 level up to the $45 level, any amount per month gives us financial space to dedicate time and energy to this project, and... You can find the page at patreon.com slash of sedge and salt to see more into what's available at each subscription tier. And I appreciate so much the folks that have been supporting on Patreon and, of course, any other types of support like messages um, of encouragement <laughs> are also great. Um, with that, let's go ahead and get into the conversation with Becky Byer. Enjoy. Thanks, y'all. I run a business called Blood and Spice Bush, mm -hmm. and I also work as a teacher for a foraging company called No Taste Like Home in Asheville. And I teach classes on, I would say, the intersections of 
folkloric herb lore from old the old world, like from Europe. Um, witchcraft, rewilding, and Appalachian folk magic. And then, of course, all things permaculture, gardening, plant things, wild foods, preserving, cooking, all that stuff. <laughs> Basically, if you wanted to be a hedge witch, <laughs> all the things you'd need to know how to do. And that's what the name of my class I'm teaching this year, uh, like a year-long class called Hedgecraft. And it's been amazing so far. And that's what we've been focusing on. You started that this spring? I did. It's a uh, five-class series of six-hour classes. And each one is geared around the seasonal lore of the season. And then we make and forage and um, create medicines, wild foods, and and, uh, old crafts. Uh, house protection charms from plants and other objects and things cool um your background with your education I know you went to college and have like a degree in plant related farming kind of thing right Mm -hmm. yeah I have two degrees now I actually just finished my master's of of the arts (laughs) in Appalachian studies and sustainability from App State uh, in Boone, and I also, yeah, I have a BS <laughs> in plant and soil science from University of Vermont. Cool. I'm overly degreed. <laughs> <laughs> and now you are, no- you're looking for your next, I know we're both those kind of people where we're like perpetual learners, like I cannot imagine a life where I'm not continuing to learn from people from the land. Same, okay. I love that about you. <laughs> <laughs> And you were saying you're looking for more, you're teaching and looking for another teacher too, right? Yeah, I had, um, I apprenticed with Natalie Bogwalker in 2011 and she was like my, and she's still a very good friend of mine. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I teach for her now, which is every time we teach together, we like kind of cry. We're like, Oh my God, I remember when I was a baby and you were my teacher (laughs) and uh, she still teaches me so much, but, um, I really would like to find somebody to study more deeply with Appalachian folk medicine Mm -hmm. because I've taught a lot of that. Honestly, most of it I've learned from reading about it and talking to people and um, lots of different people. So it's kind of like piecemeal, but I love to study with somebody and I'm hopefully, like I said, there are some people I've been reaching out to, but we'll see what happens. What would be called Appalachian folk medicine is a mix probably of like the traditions of native peoples in that area plus European traditions that were mixed with native traditions and like how that all kind of have, has like been formed from that land and out West because colonization was happened so much later. There's so much more, that knowledge is so much more in the air or like, it depends on where you are for sure. And like what happened in that place Mm -hmm. Um, and what, you know, what the land is in that place. But I just feel like it's, there's so much, like in California alone, there's so much written about the ethnobotany of so many regions of California and like wild tending and wild food, just like from, and it seems like where you are, it's almost like a finding people who are alive or like finding the right resources to, to get that information is like a, it's like a project. <laughs> it, it really is. And um, when I was at App State, everybody knows me there as like the crazy plant lady slash um like kind of gay polyamorous insane person so it's just (laughs) like I think I just like freaked them out um but I love everyone there so much they're probably like who was that person and what the heck were they doing (laughs) I was told that there's this binder of notes that somebody has collected from all these different families that's just Mm -hmm. sitting there and they're like we need somebody to transcribe these and I was like oh my gosh (laughs) so if I ever you know meet with all my free time if I ever have time, I, I might try to start transcribing these notes um, on cures and plant stuff from different mm-hmm. families in Boone, in Watauga oh. County. And th- those things to me, I think it's there. It's just been, this is one thing my friend Byron Ballard, who is a, you know, Appalachian folk magic practitioner mm-hmm. and a friend of mine here in Asheville, and she has said like Appalachian folk magic never went anywhere. It's not, it's not lost. It doesn't need to be revived. It's just not in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And I think like what you're saying with the Western stuff, some of it's still in plain sight because things have been so colonized and so squashed here for so long. 
I do think a lot of things are kept kind of more hush hush or like, oh, that's not appropriate to talk about or there's a time and a place for that, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a feeling I get from people that I interact with. Mm -hmm. And honestly, a lot of stories like app, like witch stories about witches are like one of the best ways I've learned about plant use. (laughs) Can you define what you would call Appalachian folk medicine and like how you think about it? Yeah. I think Appalachian folk medicine is a really unique blend of um, European, West African, uh, Native American, a variety of tribes, and the unique topography and spirits of the land in this place, like all coming together to create a healing system that uniquely meets the needs of the people of this place. And uh, kind of, you know, is dependent upon the unique plants that were brought here and the plants that are already here. So Hmm. I guess that's how I could define it. (laughs) Yeah, cool. I guess what you're teaching, what you're learning, what you want to be doing in the world with, with Appalachian folk medicine and I guess the inner, like maybe cultural appropriation is one, is something I've been talking about a lot about with a lot of different people lately and everyone has a different perspective on it and how to deal and how to think about it. But what do you, would you have any thoughts on that? Totally. Yeah. It's something I talk about a lot and, um, you know, I'm not, technically I am Appalachian by birth. I was born in Western Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. but culturally I was raised in like a billion different places in a bunch of different States. I went to high school in New Jersey. I've lived in California, Vermont, upstate New York. Like I have no strong cultural upbringing myself. So I even asked that question when I started studying Appalachian folk magic and medicine, like, am I allowed to do this? Is this okay? And then I spoke with a lot of different people and about it who are Appalachian and um, especially Byron, my friend. And uh, she, she's basically like, if you were trying to rip off Appalachian people or like create this like romanticized primitive ancestor hillbilly bullshit, like, yeah, that would suck. And, you know, I've lived here almost 10 years now and I will never live anywhere else. I'm firmly embedded in this world and being committed to this land and, and not just profiting off of its information but actually like doing things to protect it and promote this land and the people that live on it all of them not just some of them uh we speak about that like well how are you serving the communities that you're profiting off of you know and Appalachian foot medicine is one class I teach out of probably like 14 or 15 different topics but I do think that Appalachian folk medicine and these kind of Af- uh, American folk ways are great ways for people to not culturally appropriate things because they're a unique blend of so many different cultures. They're accessible to a, a wide variety of people. Appalachian folk medicine is accessible to black Americans, native Americans, European Americans, all those people, you know, cause that's a, it's a unique amalgamation of all of their cultural and folk knowledge. Syncretic? Syncretic, yeah. It's something that comes up in my head of like that natural blending. It's just that the conversation about cultural appropriation is so tricky because it also requires this idea of looking from the outside and saying this thing that I'm holding still is owned by these people without the idea that it can be fluid too. And yet we need to be super sensitive. And so that requires us to do that in ways. And sometimes it's hard to figure out when that's appropriate, when it isn't like, you know, how do we know, how do we name what, who owns what? My friend Sarah, who I work with a lot, who's a ballad singer and is awesome, came up, she, she shared this term with me. It's someone who's not necessarily culturally Appalachian. They, you know, like I said, I was born in Appalachia. My family's from Appalachia, but it's not, that was, I was not raised with that mindset, you know, but I'm a dedicated member of this community in Appalachia Mm -hmm. so I'm a citizen of this place but I'm not like a born and raised Appalachian Mm -hmm. and I think it's a cool way to say I'm a part of this community but I'm not like taking ownership of this identity if that makes sense yeah and it's like it seems weird to mince words but I think it's important you know and one of the reasons I like teaching about Appalachian-ness is because I think there's so much misinformation about it Mm -hmm. and uh, one of the biggest things I end up doing and I'm still working on this languaging because I've been shown ways that I've not communicated about it in the best ways because of how awkward and uncomfortable and painful the history of slavery has been in the United States is speaking about the contributions of black Americans to the Appalachian experience, which is like almost never discussed. 
Uh, because in where we live in Western North Carolina, there wasn't a plantation economy. The slave presence was different than in like the Deep South. Um, but you know, we have haint blue ceilings on porches, and the belief that the color blue can protect you from evil spirits that comes from West Africa. Whoa. You know, we, we know that, and now it's an Appalachian folk medicine. You know, <laughs> so I think the ways that for me, like doing this work, I feel like it's super important because I do have white privilege and people will listen to me sometimes, especially as a degreed person. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if they're not men, sometimes <laughs> 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 that to say, Hey, just so you know, here's Appalachia. Here's who lives here. Don't forget that there's this strong cultural contribution from people who did not choose to move here, who were brought here by force. And their culture is still here and you can find it. Um, And just like keep bringing that up because people want to argue with me about it. They're like, Africans didn't have anything to do with Appalachian folk magic or medicine. And I'm just like, I'm going to punch you. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) And uh, other friends of mine who are people of color who live here or live in the deep South have been like, Becky, can you just like hit these people with some articles can you just like help me out here and i'm like i got you i got you i'm just gonna start throwing journal oh, articles so at this person at i remember when i had this facebook thing i never do this but argument oh, yeah, I re- <laughs> <laughs> with someone that i gosh was a friend of mine at one point who i'm just like don't even know how to deal with right now just I don't know if you want to go into it, but I consulted you and you just threw a bunch of really good research at the whole conversation and it kind of just ended it right there. And I was like, yes, Peggy. <laughs> I kind of hate arguing with people. I don't do it a lot. I hate, I'm conflict avoidant cancer. What's up? Um, but one thing I'm really good at is researching things and calmly and compassionately explaining things to people I don't like. So I... <laughs> Because I have to do it a lot as a teacher, and I like most people, but when people are, like, being racist or being shitty, it's really hard to remain compassionate. So I appreciated when you were like, hey, can you help me? And I was like, oh, I got you. I got you so hard right now. <laughs> I'm in here. I was honored to help you in that moment, and I can't always do it. Sometimes people don't agree with me anyway, but yeah, yeah. it's hard to disagree with, like, a copy of an actual document from the 1400s or something, you know? Mm-hmm. First, what do you call that first uh source like primary source right it's been a while since i was in college but primary source <laughs> and are you those primary documents right <laughs> do you have any other stuff things that you could mention of how um people of color have contributed to appalachian um folklore and, and traditions Oh, definitely. I mean, if you think of too, just like, what is Appalachia? What's the first thing you think of? Probably the soundtrack, right? The banjo itself is from Africa, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I always think, whenever people start with me about that, I'm like, so do you know where banjos are from? And the way in which people fiddle and sing and share songs and stories um, is so heavily influenced by um, African folks. And Africa's a continent, you know? It's not a country. So there's... They found a lot of evidence that a lot of the folks who were specifically brought to this region, to where I live in WNC, were um, the members of different West African tribes. Mm -hmm. Some of the specific small bands of people there have kind of, they've been able to kind of trace back some of that. And I think, too, um, you know, using hog's teeth, there's a special tooth uh, molar from a hog Mm -hmm. tied around a child's neck for teething. That is an African um, survival into Appalachian folk medicine mm-hmm. and magic. I'd say that's kind of like both, right? It's mm-hmm. sympathetic magic. Mm-hmm. This tooth is going to make your tooth feel better. Mm-hmm. And um, using different roots around the neck for teething, like certain types of solanaceous plants, like horse nettle, solanum carolinans. Um, then also Native Americans use that, and they kind of combine these traditions of using these specific plant roots around the neck so they would dermally provide, uh, you know, scopalamine or whatever the solanaceous chemical was to calm the child from the pain of teething. I, I just get, I'm such a nerd. Like, I love that stuff, trying to figure out where, and some of it we don't know, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of it because of the racism and, and intense hatred uh, that Native Americans and African Americans have faced in 
our country, a lot of what they have contributed has been either said, oh, no, that's it's like when people say, oh, there's Irish slaves. And you're like, just shut your mouth like, oh, my God, (laughs) to try to diminish the experience of what African ancestry people have gone through. Mm -hmm. I see that all the time with this stuff. So a part of me feels like it's my duty and my work Mm -hmm. to continuously be clear about this. And I like I said, I still make mistakes a lot. And my students help keep me uh, on track, especially my students of color who help kind of reflect back to me how I'm doing that. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, they definitely don't need to take the time to do that with me. Mm-hmm. But um, I've been learning so much about that myself. So Cool. Um, since people who are listening to this are probably going to be from all over the country, can you just explain a little bit about what Native folks lived in that area? Um, yeah, there's a lot of nations, but the predominant large nation, which still today is here, is the Cherokee Nation. Mm-hmm. And there's also people like the Catawba, uh, both of whom I've been working with recently, uh, doing foraging for youth, which has been inc- an incredible opportunity that I, we can talk about later. But um, there's also a ton of other smaller nations, some of which are no longer uh, extant or, um, you know, in the area. Uh, the Cherokee were pretty much the main players, but there's actually this really cool app thing I found online where if you type in your zip code, it'll show you all of the nations Whoa. that ever lived in your zip code or passed mm-hmm. through it. And there were like a ton of little tribes that passed oh. through Barnardsville, North Carolina. And I was like, that's inc- incredible. Mm-hmm. So many people. And um, the Trail of Tears was an event where um, m- most of those Cherokee folks got forced to go to Oklahoma, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I know, I mean, some people don't even know what the Trail of Tears is, so it's pretty. That's kind of made the cu- culture of what it is to be Cherokee, I guess, pretty complicated these days, yeah. and then it's so divided into different areas now. Yeah, the Trail of Tears. I mean, it's a horrific. Just even reading fictional novels about it, or excuse me, non, not fiction, yeah, fictional novels. I can never remember the difference between fiction and nonfiction. <laughs> it, it's like so traumatizing, and I'm a white person, and I'm like, oh my god, like reading a fake story about this is so hard to, to read. Um, and there's actually some really interesting articles I've been reading about how the knowledge of plants changed with um, the forced migration outwards. And you know, so many Cherokees are still here because they were just like fuck it, I'm going to go hide in the woods, screw y'all, and just, like, suffered through and, like, stayed here and hid and, like, did their thing. And it's just crazy. And the Catawba as well. I had never even really heard of the Catawba except for in books until I met a Catawba youth at a class I was teaching. Mm-hmm. And he was like, hey, I'm a Catawba person, and you should come hang out. And I started reading and learning a ton about the Catawba people. They lost their nationhood in the 60s, I guess it was trying to remember and then they recently in the 90s i guess got it back they were just like yeah you're not a nation anymore the government was like bye <laughs> so it's like what do they have a just think about that, you know that's do why there's so few names now. do they have a reservation they do it's very small yeah and i've been learning so much too i feel like this is something i i see a lot like in living in wnc where it's not you know i went to high school in new jersey it was like extremely diverse where I went to school and where I lived, you know, <laughs> and I had friends, like my first partner was not white. Like I, I, all of my siblings, actually, all of our first partners were not white people mm-hmm. and all, none of them were the same race, mm-hmm. which I think is pretty cool. Cause I have four brothers and, um, it's, it's just a totally different experience, you know, of like who's around you and what you're being exposed to. And down here, I hang out with so few people of non-white races um and it's just such a different experience so when I've started working with the Cherokee and Catawba people it's I almost like don't know what to do I'm like am I messing up am I saying bad things like and most of the time it's like my own like my friends call me some of my friends call me the white people police because I'm always like that's racist you know stop (laughs) stop that okay and I kind of police them and I don't mean to but I'm just like you're saying problematic stuff and I need to talk to you about it but then I hang out with actual people of color and they're like, the thing you're fixating on as a white person for me is actually not a big deal. Like, can you stop? And I'm like, oh shit, like, wow, look at me go, you know, and acting my white privilege in this other weird way that I didn't realize. Nobody likes being called out or criticized because it's like, oh, I'm a bad person. I'm terrible. But 
it's more about like what's the truth and I've gotten this from multiple people like when white people police other white people about how they interact with Native American or black people or Chinese people or this or that it's it doesn't matter it's like ask the people it's actually affecting how they like oh, as a majority would like to experience you know things and, and my friend who's Cherokee was like hey do you want to learn how to speak all the Cherokee names of all these plants and I was like am I allowed to do that is that okay he's like I literally am am telling you like I want you to do this I was like oh, oh okay but I was like almost like trying to police him from doing it teaching me this because mm-hmm. I felt like it wasn't okay okay for me to do it I'm so happy we can talk about this because it's so complicated and weird and it's like what's should that even be an issue? What were you, I want to hear what you're having to say about your experience. I was at an Earth Skills gathering recently. Um, you know Erin Fahey? Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, so I, she and this person named John Makawa, they, he's a Hopi Tewa elder that was up teaching um, traditional coiled um, pottery. And she's really knowledgeable about that primitive pottery as well. And so they kind of co-taught, like he mainly taught, but she like assisted him and got clay for him and like, cause he's all older, you know, and he's yeah. an older and there's, he just has, you know, I've interviewed him for this project too, but I have to do a lot of editing on it. So I'm not sure when it will come out, but he has just a perspective too, that um, I find really fascinating. Like it, he's like, this is native clay and this is native pottery. And he told Aaron that she, she should call her stuff native like she used native clay and she's like I don't feel like comfortable using that word you know to describe what my craft is because I'm not native to this place and just having hearing them have a conversation about that um was really great and he was just like well the clay is native to this place like you're calling the clay native you like he's like I don't think it's a big deal but he also and there was other things like that, you know, where, you know, he's just like, you think you're overthinking that, some of those <laughs> things, you know. <laughs> but yeah. I think, but then someone else might be offended by you calling your work native something when it's not, you know, it's tricky. Because, like, yeah. No, and somebody will be, you know, I actually, if I can share an experience I had recently where yeah. I got... I would never call this a call out. I would say it was a call in because the woman that did it with me was so kind and compassionate and I was not expecting her gentleness. Mm -hmm. Um, And she, which she did not owe to me in any way, but was so sweet. (laughs) It made it go down a lot easier. I was teaching about, I was leading a foraging walk and I do a lot of teaching about, um, you know, I always try to insert the history of the plants. And I said the word African settlers instead of slaves and she is a woman of color and um, of African ancestry. And I was like, and later she in privately came up to me and said, hey, could you just like say slaves and just like not say settlers? And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. I actually changed, I normally say the word slaves, but I, for some reason, didn't want to say that word in front of her. Mm-hmm. And cause I, I felt like it was disempowering or something. Like, And subconsciously, I didn't even think about any of this it just happened. Mm -hmm. And I felt so bad because I was like, it was so intense. And she and I had this amazing conversation about it. And she was so patient with me. And I was like, Oh my God, we like hugged a million times. But I was so thankful for her to remind me of that because it's just, it needs to be spoken about. But you know, I also, we, we both talked about how another person of color might be like upset by that being talked about. Hmm. And both things can happen at the same time and both people's feelings are totally valid. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest thing. Like you said, it's what one person would say is okay. No, but one person can speak for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we just have to do the best we can with each person and also know that we're, you know, trying to do the best with the tools that we have as individuals. Mm -hmm. One of the things in my teaching I've been doing is teaching European traditional witchcraft not because, not for white supremacists to get stoked about, contrary mm-hmm. to popular belief. You wouldn't believe how many people are like, hey, I'm a white supremacist. I love your work. And I'm like, I hate you. Please never. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Do not read anything I write. Um, wow. But, uh, yeah, it's really weird. But teaching it as a way for people of European ancestry to get in touch with their own past and not try to appropriate another culture 
in ways that makes people who are alive right now who are of that culture uncomfortable and Mm -hmm. upset you know Mm -hmm. and that's also confusing to me I think it's hard to say like you know I practice traditional English and German witchcraft because I'm English and German and then Appalachian folk magic and it's it's so empowering to to do the other day I made an herb bundle with chamomile fennel and um beaver few and all these plants are you know are not native to where I live but they all grow in my garden Mm -hmm. and just now by themselves come up they've naturalized and they were all used by my ancestors to ward away evil and fire at midsummer which is something I celebrate and it felt so amazing for me to pick those plants that I grew and imagine did I have an aunt did I have a great 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 grandmother who picked these plants and bundled them you know, I could feel that direct connection. And for me, I, one thing I'd love to offer with my classes is an option for people to be like, oh, I actually have my own meaningful spiritual past and I don't have to take from other cultures. And one, it can feel more meaningful for that person to directly experience that. And two, it can help combat the kind of irresponsible cultural appropriation spiritually that people do. Mm-hmm. White people. It's tricky because... Um connecting with the, you know, if you're of European descent and connecting with those traditions and the plants of that place, but yet you live in this place, you know, finding that fine balance between like making the connection with the place where you are in a new way completely than what maybe people did in the past and also connecting with your own like genetic lineage. Yeah. Finding that, you know, cause inherently as longer you are in a place, the more that land shapes you too. So I think Yes. <laughs> My family's been in America since 1668. So it's like, you know, it's hard to say I'm not native to this place. My family's been here for a long time, but they're here because they pushed other people out. Mm-hmm. And I need to use that too. Mm-hmm. And I think you're, what you said is so wise. It's, and that's the beauty of bioregionalism and that term I like am obsessed with and love. I'm not sick of it yet. I know it's like some people are like, ah, bioregionalism, we've talked about it too much. But yeah, sinking into the space you live in. Um, but like where we live, there's so many plants now from all over the world, everywhere, you know? Um, kudzu and burdock and chickweed and all the different yeah. things. And they all have stories from where they've come from. Mm-hmm. And then they have new stories, you know? Like poke is a native plant, and it has so much use in native history. And then it has use in African American folk magic to break curses and help with arthritis when you carry the root with you. Uh, and then in Appalachian folk magic in general, practiced by all the different types of people that practiced it. And I just think it's fantastic because to me, those native plants with their, all the different contributions, they all have these stories, you know, mm-hmm. influenced by where each of those people came from. It's been interesting for me. You know, I was like totally a farmer for years and now I'm kind of in this traveling phase to rethink about what the word bioregionalism means or bioregional medicine, because, you know, just when you move just on the outskirts of what you consider the Appalachian bioregion or the Southern Appalachian bioregion is a zone where things maybe just shift just a little bit, but like some of those plants still cling and then you shift a little more and maybe the soil changes, but some of those plants cling and then the ways those plants were used and seen maybe is the same, but like some other things are different. And then it, the way it kind of like these tendrils go out into the world based on how the land is shaped. Um, you know, it's hard to draw, draw lines around what is a bioregion. Now I'm realizing now because just thinking about seeing similar or the same plants in so many different places and how different people use them in different ways or the same ways or how that plant takes on different personalities in different places. And just, you know, would you consider a whole river a bioregion or would you consider a whole watershed or a whole mountain chain or just one mountain or, you know, I think, yeah, I don't know. I think about that a lot. So. Okay, such a good question. It's good to question everything, Kelly, and it seems like you do, and I love that about <laughs> you. You're so smart and inquisitive. And what, I like the way that um, Kirkpatrick Sale talks about 
Uh, I don't know if that's the right name. <laughs> Sale? I don't know how to say his last name right. But I love his work on bioregionalism. And he's talking about, you know, the problem here is that we are deciding still what is a bioregion as humans. But his definition of a bioregion is the dictate non-human beings dictating it. So this where this amphibian species lives, that's a bioregion. You know, the where the uh, the spotted newt lives, you know, like it, things like that, or the the great horned owl, you know, or any of the creatures and beings, or where does golden mountain heather exist, you know, only like in Watauga County, you know, that's a bioregion. And I think, like you said, there there's a billion little circles all intersecting each other mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And also, one of the things I love as a folk magical and folk ways practitioner who also like is on Instagram and like likes to go out to dinner, you know, I I do a lot of different, and I shop at Target, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not one bioregion as a person, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think trying to get away from so strictly defining certain things, like, sometimes it's good to do that, and sometimes it's just not helpful, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like, this goes back into, I guess, what we're talking about, like, you can do this, you can't do that, this is this person's, this is that person's, like, sometimes it's just not black and white. Most things are actually not, I've yeah, found. For sure. <laughs> They're very complex and nuanced, and they change. <gasps> that brings up something I've been asking folks and thinking about a lot lately, because the topic of wild crafting is huge. It's more, I feel like bigger in the West, the, the moral dilemma around wild crafting as settlers of this place and obviously that conversation in deserts or in places where um, there's drought and there's a lot of humans who are getting into herbal medicine. There's this concern around, I mean, some herb schools now out west don't even cheat, don't even, no one, there's no wild crafting at all that happens. It's only if you're in the garden or you maybe learn how to grow the thing or only do flower essences. There's some schools that only focus on that so that there's not the taking having lived in Appalachia for many years and in the Piedmont and also in New England and some other places that are very lush and abundant. Yeah. There's issues with like over harvesting of certain woodland medicinals that have value on the marketplace. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's just concern out here, even with harvesting things that might be even abundant just because it's like this colonial mentality that we should be able to wild craft, you know, anyways, I I guess I'm, just you haven't heard about this i have a little bit but i thought i didn't realize it was the um modus operandi kind of behind it Mm -hmm. i thought it was due to the ecological pressure i mean i think that's part of it but i think the conversations are being had around the extension of colonialism that people are feeling like is happening through the the popularity of herbal medicine now I feel a feeling coming up when I hear you say that. I'm like, ooh, I feel defensive. I have a right to pick plants. I'm a human, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where does that come from? Wow, Mm -hmm. that's interesting to see that come up for me. Because where I live, there's so many friggin' plants, you know? It's just, (laughs) like you said, it's just so lush and crazy. You know, I, over the past two years, I've taken people to the same places over and over and over and over again to pick plants. None of those plants are gone. You know what I mean? Like there, I can see them over the past two years just be like bushed out and like most of them picking things like spice bush or um, even taking twigs and things from trees. And it's, it's just incredible to see that. And I also wonder, I, I can see both ways too. I think I agree with Lori. I don't think never wild harvesting anything is necessarily the answer, but I do think um, coming up with solutions, like if there is an herb that, like sweetgrass or yerba santo that white people are harvesting a lot of. I know this happens with white sage also in Montana. I saw that when I was out there for a little while. Um, If that's happening, then maybe new solutions need to be made about management and access. And also like I've been teaching a class recently called growing wild food. And that's like the thing I'm really excited about right now is like how to, I've been transplanting a lot of stuff like Sochan, a traditional Cherokee food, native plant. I transplanted it to my garden and it's gigantic. It loves being in the garden. Mm-hmm. So now I don't have to go to the woods to harvest Sochan anymore. It's right here. Mm-hmm. And I harvest it constantly and it's, it loves it. It's just gigantic. It bushes out like basil almost when you pick the leaves off of it. 
and things like that to me, it's not like I have access to every single plant whenever I want, no boundaries. It's more like which plants are okay. Let's look at this more realistically. You know, it's not, it's not true that it's harmful to pick any plants ever. That's just not true. You know what I mean? That's how humans are alive, but, but we are, we can really damage some things more than others. So I, I think I kind of agree that the intention needs to be really clear and that people maybe need way more education before they are allowed to wildcraft or wild harvest. Maybe there, you know, needs to be more structure on that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, some plants thrive off of human tending. I think that's something, the idea that humans are part of the ecology of place too, and that a lot of plants just need human engagement. I've been learning that about oaks in California and how much they actually really depended on humans to thrive and all the ways that humans would tend to oak groves because the biggest food here would be was acorns. And how like doing controlled burns and that alkaline the soil so that the oaks then would produce more acorns and then you know and then all these other plants that would grow under them too and um yeah i think any broad generalizations can be tricky to uphold you know at the same time i think being overly cautious and then sort of initiating people into it is could be a good thing or it's also you know like dandelions are everywhere <laughs> like I mean we, if we yeah. could all eat dandelions I think things would be so much better in the world you know so there's a sense for me about like the need for a reconnection or I mean it's like imminent right now like we we need that really badly so it sometimes feels like to keep people from picking dandelion because they're afraid that they might be doing something wrong is, I don't know, I think it's a scale, like. Yeah. <laughs> I totally it. agree with you. And I think, too, like, one thing I notice a lot, and I teach my, I have five apprentices right now who I am obsessed with, and I love them so much. And I, I always tell them, I'm like, warning, I'm about to give you an unpopular opinion. You don't have to <laughs> hear it or listen to it or agree with it. One of mine is, like, I don't give thanks every time I pick a plant. I don't, like, reach out and say, hey, plant I'm gonna like give this huge offering to take one of your leaves because I don't believe that I deserve the leaf but I believe it's natural and normal for me to eat leaves because I'm a human and I think that the types some of the things I've noticed in like kind of new age herbalist like kind of unaligned with specific traditions practices is this kind of like prostrating yourself before nature and I think it's very artificial and it's it's creating these huge walls between people and nature. And it's saying, I'm not a part of this system. I'll never be a part of it. And, you know, as white people too, it gets even more complicated because you're like, where am I allowed to be? What am I allowed to do? And then, you know, people of color deal with their own questions of where am I allowed to be? What am I allowed to do? And everybody's like, I feel like I have this identity issue, access issues. And like, am I allowed to be in nature? And I think that's a, such a, a shitty thing that's kind of happened. So I always tell my students, I'm like, you don't need to give thanks every time you walk outside. Like, you are a part of this earth. You've always been. You've never been apart from nature. It's an illusion. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's the saddest thing, and it makes me so upset when I see people feel this kind of unworthiness to be in the beautiful world for whatever reason, for whatever culture. And I do think that those practices, I, they need to be questioned. I don't think they have to be stopped. It's great to give thanks, you know. For me, what I do is I end up giving thanks eight times a year when I celebrate my high holidays, like Midsummer or Beltane or Solstice, things like that, you know. I give thanks in a big way mm -hmm. eight times a year. And obviously, when I find something special that I don't see every day or something that's very rare, I'm going to feel really different about it. But when I harvest the Sochan that I grow in my garden... I don't necessarily think about it a lot. I'm just like, I'm going to go eat dinner because I'm a human and I need to eat food, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I want to like, once again, offer both ways, like ask ourselves, like, why do we give thanks in this specific way? And does it serve you or is it creating a larger barrier between you and your integration back into nature? Because you were never out of it. We've always been in it. Even when I lived in New Jersey, 
was still in nature. <laughs> That's something I've been thinking about a lot too, that whole idea that if you're in a, in a city, you're not in nature. I mean, you're there for one thing as human, <laughs> and there are trees in cities, and there are bugs crawling across the sidewalk, and there's most definitely dandelion somewhere, and there's birds, yeah, that fly over, and squirrels, squirrels, coyotes, <laughs> there's always coyotes in cities, believe it or not, so. Oh, yeah, I saw coyotes as a child in LA all the time, they ate my cat. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, but when I was little, this is actually kind of a funny, I'll just say this really quick. When I was little, I think I was destined to be like a weirdo, like pagan. I was four years old, I think, and I saw our cat get snatched by a coyote, and I was crying, and my mom was trying to comfort me, and then she said I stopped crying, and I looked up at her, and she got freaked out. You know me, I'm really chatty, I talk a shit ton, and I have since I was like one. And I looked up at her, and I went, Mom. I'm not sad anymore because I think that Coyote needed Casey more than we did. Our cat's name was Casey because she <laughs> had four little coyote puppies with her. And wow. she said, I realized that the cat was going to feed the puppies. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay with it. And I stopped crying. I was like, totally fine with it. And she was like, what the fuck is wrong with my kid? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why I was like that. My mom and dad are completely conventional people, you know, but I guess it was just me. Uh, that's funny. Are any of your brothers or are you, you only have brothers? You said. I have four little brothers. Yeah. <laughs> are they into any of this? Like, are they into making things and herbalism and witchcraft and? Folk Absolutely medicine? not. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my stepbrothers plays music with me. He's in a fantastic musician. So one of them, I have a shared interest in music with one of them. Um, otherwise, we have no shared interests, <laughs> but we all love each other a lot. Uh, we all struggle with substance abuse issues, so we can all bond on that. And um, it's, yeah, it's really weird. No one in my family does what I do, and I have no clue how this happened. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, I'm i realizing now I got my plant bug and my making things bug from my family for sure, because definitely the green thumb runs in the family. My, grand, my dad and my grandma both were plant people, and then apparently hit her, my grand, great grandpa was too. And I've just started to really realize that in the past few years, like, oh, right, makes a lot of sense. But it just took sometimes it takes these roundabout ways, and maybe one of your ancestors had a connection to all this. Yeah. My grandpa and grandma grew a garden on my dad's side, but they sprayed it with like all kinds of chemicals. My dad was like, Yeah, I used to have to carry the sprayer around, and you know put the roundup on everything, and I was like, oh, God, that explains so much. Yeah, I mean, my family definitely did that, too. Like, they ran the nursery business, and the way that you're trained to do that is to spray it all, and they had to get someone to come out there to inspect for the fungicides. I don't know. It was just so much of that that I don't want to have anything to do with now. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Besides being really into Appalachian folk medicine and teaching about it and knowing so much about that kind of ethnobotany of that region and um, having a huge knowledge of wild foods and their historical context in that place, you also make a lot of stuff. Like you're a craftsperson. Can you talk about that a little bit? Seems like you make. I love making. Yeah, I definitely am a spoon woman. I love carving <laughs> spoons. That's my favorite thing to do. And I actually, yeah, I, I think it's one of the ways that my current partner wooed me was he brought me an entire apple tree shoved into his Honda, like, that he had cut up. And he's like, I brought you this apple tree. I was like, oh, my God, I love you. That and frozen deer meat and dahlias from his grandma's garden. I was like, you're a winner. I'm keeping you. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I got really into British. You know, I love witchcraft. And I through that, I listened to Appalachian, or excuse me, English folk music. And then I started watching these documentaries about English folk woodworking and the um, bodger kind of tradition mm -hmm. and found out how that came into the Appalachia. And then I took a class with Baron Brown, who we both know from mm -hmm. the Skills gatherings. And I was just hooked. Like probably, I think I, it was 2011. I took my first class and I've been teaching spoons like two years after that. I started teaching it because I got so obsessed with it <laughs> and I love doing that. I also teach now I teach kudzu basket making. Um, but I actually just kind of split them and weave them together. Um, Nancy basket teaches that taught me the coiled basket 
um, process, which I also learned at the Earth Skills Gatherings. Mm-hmm. And anything I can make, I like to. I do tulip poplar baskets and I do a lot of food things. I love to cook. I preserve a lot of food. I make krauts and ferment stuff. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm obsessed with vinegar. That's everything is vinegar for me because I don't drink alcohol. I make all these syrups and vinegars and stuff to drink. Mm-hmm. Burnt oxymel. Oxymel, man. They're, they're the holy, thing. Holy sweet baby Jesus. I love oxymels. <laughs> vinegar extracts, which I, apparently I found out recently come from Persia originally. Huh. Yeah. An oxymel is a vinegar and a honey or just a vinegar? It's a vinegar honey extract. So I, I peeled a bunch of birch bark into a vinegar and I tinctured, quote unquote, you know, tinctured it in the vinegar. Mm-hmm. Probably six weeks because I forgot about it. And then I squeezed it all out and I mixed one to one the vinegar I had with honey. And holy balls, it's so good. <laughs> holy crap, it's so good. I, um, I've been wanting to make a sweet gum oxymel. So. Of course, I'm not, I mean, I found a sweet gum around here the other day, and I think it actually just grows around here, but just not very abundantly, which mm-hmm. I just think of that as, a, I mean, it's not even that abundant Appalachia compared to the Piedmont where I'm from, but it's just, you can chew on the petiole, right, is that what it's called, the leaf stem, mm-hmm. and it's just, I mean, Juliet taught us that one in chestnut school, I was like, oh, that, and it's just a tasty, like, tree medicine plant, and I was like, I wonder what that would be like in, as an oxymel, but I haven't made that many, and I feel like it'd be nice to not have so much 95% alcohol going through me, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I still take tinctures, even though I don't drink anymore, and I just dilute them in water now and stuff, you know, and it's fine, but the vinegar medicines I've been loving, so my partner also doesn't drink, and he doesn't like to have the tinctures. But he'll take, he loves the vinegars and the honeys. So I've been doing a lot of honey and glycerites and things like that. And it's nice to have other choices for people in recovery, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, so they don't have to ingest alcohol if if that's triggering for them. Mm -hmm. So also, have you used the the gumballs for tincture before? No. Have you? I learned about that. Yeah, it's an Appalachian folk medicine thing. Um, They have a chemical in them, and I'm going to say it wrong. It's like shigellic acid i think mm-hmm. it's the same stuff that's in tamiflu so if you tincture the green gumballs when they're still green it turns like this dark brown black color and it is great for flu whoa Isn't that crazy something else recently a friend of mine showed me which is not a new thing it's just i just never did it because i'm like always thought anti-sugar but she's been putting making sh- sugar syrups out of plants like she did it with a bunch of different pine species and you just stick the plant matter in the jar and then you just pour a bunch of sugar on it and eventually it makes a syrup or like a syrup, a sugar extract kind of of that plant and she gave me a bunch of different samples of like different yeah here's a ponderosa pine one here's a sugar pine one here's a pinion pine one and oh my god they're so good <laughs> like it's just a different taste and honey infusions you know and then it just literally sugar liquefies infusing the plant in the process and i just thought i wonder if that would be cool with the sweet gum what do we what do you call them again i don't know the official botanical term of the sweet gum (laughs) gumballs i don't know what it's called botanically you see everyone thinks i'm a botanist but i'm really not i'm a folk herbalist you know like yeah. I have a degree in plant science, and I took a semester of plant physiology, so I know all the words, but I've totally forgotten them. Some people are always like, you know, the ding dangler, and I'm like, the what? <laughs> I, I'm like not a very experienced botanist, but I, because when I teach people how to identify things, I'm not saying like, look at the midrib and look at the petiole. Like I'm like, so here's violet. It's leave. It's it's serrated edge. It looks like teeth, right? They all point down. Violet gets to the point. Like I make up little stories. Yeah plants I don't often teach them the botany which maybe I'm screwing everything up by doing that but I think for baby's first plant walk it's great to not have to try to learn botanical terms I know I think about that with botany because I'm into it and I'm kind of halfway like geeky about it um some things I just can't remember to save my life like certain terms yeah. and all that but I haven't taught a ton I I here and there and I'm I'm interested in doing it more but I think I haven't quite figured out my style with how much I should be into the botany or how much I should be into the 
stories or the ethnobotany and how to kind of merge all that fluidly. I guess you just have to kind of do it and just see you develop your way, you know, and see what people's needs are and what's most accessible and what keeps people's attention and like what they want and like and how that works for you. So mm-hmm. I feel That's like what I've been learning a lot about teaching so many classes over the past mm-hmm. couple of years. Yeah. I'm always surprised by what people are like most excited about. Yeah, like, do you have an example of something that you didn't expect? Yeah, like, you know, my basket-making classes are my lowest fill. They almost, sometimes I have to cancel them. Hmm. And people are like, baskets are great. And I'm like, I know, why don't you come to one of my classes? Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But then I'll teach a class, I, I taught a class on um, Appalachian witch lore. Forty students came to it. It was the best-selling class I've ever had, and it was just on the folklore and uses of plants in the ter- in the super niche kind of Appalachian witch context. Wow. And 40 people, and a lot of men came, which I don't get a lot of men in my classes. And it was um, really interesting. You know, and a lot of different ages of people came. My demographic is like 40 to 50-something white ladies. You know, those mm-hmm. are the people who come to my classes huh. consistently. <laughs> and uh, I love them. They let me eat. So thank you so much to all of <laughs> And, but it was so cool. There's this very diverse crew like showed up and I was like, what is it about this? And it's because people want the lore, Mm -hmm. you know, that's what I want. When I look at what I want to learn, you said, you don't know whether to focus on this or that. I want to know the the uses of it, but I really want to know the lore. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I am consistently trying to figure out how to talk about, but the myths around I guess rural people, southern people, and Appalachian people. I mean, you, t- you touched a little bit on this in the beginning of our conversation, just the complexity of what Appalachian is, but do you have any thoughts on, I don't know, yeah, that misconception around rural people and um, how you navigate that on a day-to-day basis with what you do? Definitely. I think um, what I keep coming back to is how – It's been like this since, you know, I guess his name was William Goodell. He was the president of Berea College in the 1880s or something. I'm probably messing up the dates. But he was the one who called Appalachian white people our our primitive ancestors. I think he called them our living ancestors. He basically thought that Appalachian folks were these like Anglo-Saxon relics that like had somehow managed to survive. And so it basically applied the noble savage um, archetype to Appalachian mountain white people. And then of course the black people living in Appalachia continued to receive the same stereotyping that all black people were receiving. Plus that kind of mountain, like primitive backwards thing. And same with the Native American people, all being applied with this kind of savage, yet romantically interesting and like a hub of some kind of knowledge we want, you know? And I think that still happens so much. I get told that too. Like people often assume very easily that I am an Appalachian. Like I was raised in a shack in Appalachia. I'm like, no, my dad's a banker and my mom worked for pharmaceutical companies. Like, (laughs) yeah, no, uh, no beating around the bush with those ones, you know? my first car um so it's you know it's just funny because they're like it's so amazing how you've you know you've survived and persevered through all this and I'm like I didn't do anything (laughs) I didn't do any of this I just have a good memory (laughs) you know that's how I do all this but I just think that constantly asking questions and when we talk about this stuff bringing up that idea of like I always ask people like why are you interested in Appalachian folk medicine And most people say, because my parents did it or my grandparents did it and I want to know more about it because they didn't teach it to me because it was what poor people did Hmm. and it was associated with poverty. And they didn't want me to be associated with that, so they didn't teach it to me. Hmm. And that's funny too, you know, we talk about um, cultural appropriation and this and that and, you know, foraging itself is very popular now, which is like a large way I make my living. And now it's a thing that rich people like to do for fun, and it used to be laughed at. People weren't allowed to go to schools in Appalachia if they'd eaten ramps because they'd say they'd stink up the classroom, you know? So I think it's interesting to always be talking about these history and the context of all the things we're doing 
not to like hold them in time. Like you said, things grow and change in our living traditions, you know? Um, but constantly asking like, who has access to what I'm teaching? Who, how can I give more access to those who don't have it? And let's never forget like the original context of these things. Cause Appalachia was not isolated. It's, it's top, top, topographically isolated, but you know, trade and, and the industry in Appalachia has always existed. Mm-hmm. It wasn't this like repository for untouched, unchanged culture. It was a very dynamic place, as we know, you know, we've lived here for a while, but I think as long as we constantly kind of face those questions, we can, and and face the things in ourselves that want to romanticize them, you know, because mm-hmm. I know I want to. <laughs> just I see, and I don't know how to think about this, I'm from the rural south, and but a different kind of place in Appalachia, a little bit culturally, but yeah that dynamic of romanticism and yet people sort of making fun of rural folks as if they're dumb, you know, like singing the, you know, the deliverance song and like, Oh yeah. You know, like the simultaneous looking down and looking up upon, and it's kind of confusing sometimes and figuring out how to navigate that and being a person that's from the rural South. And yet I, I'm also college educated and, you know, my family had an interest in plants and, like, working with the land, but I don't know. Yeah, there's, it's it's all very, so, yeah, I don't know how to fit myself in that stereotype sometimes because I'm in that world and also in, I'm out here. I'm gone, I'm all over the place, so, um, and I'm changed by that engagement. So, anyways, thanks for offering your opinion on that because, you say no it a lot more eloquently than I feel like I can. So um. I've had to think a lot about it. Being an <laughs> Appalachian Studies major, it's like all you read about is like how to change the shitty things people think about Appalachians. Mm-hmm. Well, um, what do you see? You're so you live in Barnardsville. I heard that you're living like on a community, like at the old Hawk and Ivy, right? That's yeah. where I live. I live at a farm called the Hawk and Ivy. And I manage it here with my friend Mike and Zane and all of our buddies who live here. We all worked together at Bucci Kombucha years ago, and so we've known each other for a while. And it's a lot of fun. We have an event space, and we've been it's an old barn, nice outdoor kind of teaching space. So we've been doing a ton of classes and full moon gatherings and all different kinds of stuff. And I'm really thankful to get to live here for sure. What do you see as the future of what you're doing? Like, do you have, I mean, what do you envision in a few years with your work? Well, I really would like to, you know, have my school be supporting me completely. That would be amazing. Um, and I'd like to be able to, like, get out of debt. <laughs> that's I would, that's in, like, 10 years. That'd be really cool. We'll see. Um, but I really would like to be kind of – I'm kind of developing three different little mini schools, one on witchcraft, one on farming and mountain farming specifically, and, like, biointensive and biodynamic farming. and then woodworking and woodcraft skills mm-hmm. especially for women so those are the three things I'm focusing on and I also would like to write some books so I'm gonna get started on that soon mm-hmm. that all sounds really nice yeah I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing now I'm, it's been a rough past couple years for me but these this past two years have just been incredible and so much has happened I feel like I've just started my life you know I'm 30 years old and I'm so excited about the future and so excited every day to wake up and do these things and see the plants and see the people and how excited they are to know it. So I think that just continuing to share with people the meaningful nature of having relationships with, with the world that they live in, that's what I am excited to keep doing. So. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Becky, for doing this interview. And um Will you just say for folks, like, how people can find you online? Yeah, you can visit me at my website. It's Mm bloodandspicebush.com. And I'm also on Facebook. I'm Becky Byer, B-E-Y-E-R. Well, Rebecca, I changed it, because let's be real. Not going to be named Becky these days. It's very silly. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Got to level up once you hit 30, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I um, also am on Instagram as Blood and Spice Bush, so you can find out about my classes and things on my website. And um, I'm doing a few free foraging walks in Asheville this year. Since I don't generate enough income yet to donate to the causes that I believe in, I've been I've decided that sharing foraging for free is the best thing I can do for my community. So watch out for those. They'll be on Facebook and on my website. Well, um, yeah, thanks so much for doing this. And I hope I get to actually see you in person soon. So. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you for having me, Kelly. I love the work you're doing, and you're such an inspiration. I hope I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye, dear. You just listened to episode 7 of the Ground Shots podcast, a conversation with Becky Byer of Blood and Spice Bush. Since we recorded this interview last spring, Becky has teamed up with Abby Artemisia out of Asheville, North Carolina to form the Sassafras School, where they will be leading a a once-a-week, six-month course on folk herbalism and foraging starting May of 2019. And you can find out more on their website, sassafras-school.com, and you'll find this website linked Um, as well as any other relevant links in our show notes. So thanks again for listening, and don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think of the podcast. Until next time, y'all. This episode of the Ground Shots podcast was produced by Opia Creative. Our music is by Mother Marrow. If you'd like to help us continue to make this audio project a reality, consider becoming a monthly supporter on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash obsessionsalt where we have rewards like entry into patron-only giveaways, additional audio interviews, extra educational content, and much more. You can also share our work and give us a review on iTunes. Visit our website at obsedgeandsalt.com to see what else we're up to and a log of our episodes when they come out. Check out our show notes for information about how to find us and our guests. Until next time, y'all. Thanks for listening.